Inside the Yusai Jama Shopping District lies an eccentric but close-knit community of business owners. Tomako Kibishirakawa, a clumsy, though adorable, teenage girl belongs to a family of mochi bakers who own a quaint shop called Tamaya. One day, Tamako stumbles upon a talking bird that presents himself as royalty from a distant land. Dara Mochimazi, as he calls himself, states that he's seeking a bride for his country's prince. Intent on his mission, Dara follows Tamako home and develops an addiction to mochi, that's becoming painfully overweight and subsequently unable to fly back to his homeland, so he takes up residence with Tamako's family and becomes the community's beloved mascot. Meanwhile, Tamako's friend, Mokshizu Uji, continues to hide his true feelings for her. Their fathers are fierce mochi rivals, but will it be enough to drive a wedge between Tamako and Mokshizu? And just what will happen to Dara's task of finding his prince's destined bride? Tamako is a happy-go-lucky school girl who is going back home with her friends. They were discussing how each of them would spend their winter vacation. Tamako had an idea about making a Christmas tree-shaped mochi for their family's mochi display. She bid her friends farewell and went to the market. She was well acquainted with everyone in the market, as they were a close-knit community and bought many things. She went to a flower shop where the shop owner asked about her day so far. Tamako answered that it was going well and started looking at flowers. She saw a cute yet weird-looking bird scooch between the flowers and suddenly the bird came and flew into her face. She was surprised and threw the bird away from her face. She picked him up quickly, and the bird started acting condescending and said that she shouldn't fall for him yet. He tried to show off his charm, but Tamako was even more surprised hearing a bird talk and threw him out of the shop. But the bird didn't leave her and took its new place on her head. She was too scared and said that he should leave, but the bird didn't hear her and kept sitting on her head. Everybody at the market thought that he was Tamako's pet bird, but the reality was far more different from it. With a scared and reluctant heart, she went to her home and heard a fight going on. Tamako and Uji Makizu were good childhood friends, but sadly their fathers didn't get along at all. They both had a mochi shop, but Mochizu's father was more into modern mochi making and Tamako's father had a more traditional approach towards mochi making. They were having an argument over the modern board that Mochizu's father had set up for his shop. Tamako said that the board was good, which caused a fight among the mochi fathers, and amidst the fight, the bird fell from Tamako's head to the ground. The bird fainted, and they carefully carried it inside Tamako's father's shop. Anko, Tamako's little sister, had just come back home from school and asked her grandpa why they sold mochis. He said that they have been doing this since his great-grandfather's time. She took a mochi from him and greeted Mokshizu, who she called Mochi affectionately. She asked about the fainted bird lying on the cushion. Tamako said that how she went to the florist and saw him between the flowers. Suddenly, the bird got up and said that he was no ordinary bird, but the retainer of a royal court from his bird kingdom. He was on his quest to find a bird bride for the prince of his country, but he somehow fainted on his journey. That's when he met Tamako, who was totally enamored by his beauty. He said that when Tamako saw him and sneezed on him, it meant his bird community that she was courting him. Even though he can't accept her proposal, he can still grace her with his presence, and now he had decided to stay with her. Everybody was already creeped out by a talking bird, but that wasn't the end of it. He got up on the head of Tamako and introduced himself as Dira Mokamazi, sounding like mochi disgusting and Tamako's father was already angered by his name, as he disrespected his sacred mochi. Now came the time to decide what they would do the talking bird with a narcissism complex. Anko asked Tamako if she wanted to keep the bird, as she had already bought a book on birds. She said that she didn't know yet, but she was quite intrigued by the bird. They went to the local bathhouse and met Mokshizu, who was on his way home from the bath. He got a bit flustered after seeing Tamako. She told him that her birthday was coming up, and this time she wanted a gift from him. He mustered up his courage to ask her what she wanted as a present, but Tamako was already headed inside. He saw a cold-stricken Dara approaching, who asked him about the bathhouse after hearing about this hothouse, which would provide him with warmth. He got on Mochi's shoulder, who took him inside. He stopped before Dara could speak and threatened to throw him away if he speaks in front of others. He tried to oblige but spoke up after some time. Dara explored the bathhouse and suddenly heard Tamako's voice. He flew up to see her and had a nosebleed from all the estrogen. But he got brutally thrown over by Tamako to the other side for his hentai attempt. The next day, Tamako helped at her father's shop and went to school, while Dara was sharing a room with Mochi. He tried to wake Mochi up, who was in deep sleep while having dreams about Tamako. Dara slapped him with his wings and asked why he had to share the room with him when Mochi was the one who was a pervert. Mochi said that it was because of his indecent attempts in the bathhouse, so it would be dangerous to leave him at Tamako's room. Dara flew away from his room. Meanwhile, Tamako was hanging out with her friends who asked her about her birthday present. She said that she would love a new board for their mochi shop. 
Suddenly, a shuttlecock hit her forehead by their class president, but Tamako just let it go. The shop owners at the market were planning to celebrate Tamako's birthday, too. Tamako went to the cafe with Dara, where the cafe owner was trying to find the song which Tamako's mother used to sing for her in her childhood. Dara asked why she did not ask her mother, but she said that her mother had passed when she was in fifth grade. Dara tried to comfort her, but she said that she wouldn't lose hope so early, as she was a mochi maker's daughter and she wanted everybody to have the mochi her mother loved so much. Meanwhile, Dara was getting too used to his life at the Tamea residence. He kept Banj eating mochi and stayed with them. He thought that he would leave during the New Year's. Soon New Year came along with Tameko's birthday, but mochi was still there and bigger than ever after having mochis every day. He was so fat now that Tameko's father told him to change his name to Maka Delicious. Since it was the New Year, Tamea's shop was quite busy with her sales and Machizu was hell-bent on giving her his gift this time for sure. Dara was getting ready to leave but could not fly at all with his chubby figure. But he had already pledged to leave, so he went to the Tamako family and told them not to cry as he was leaving. He told Tamako not to request him or cry for him as a man must not be swayed by tears. But Tamako casually bid him buy and fed him a freshly pounded mochi as his farewell gift. He fell down after eating the mochi. On the other hand, Mokizu was taking his gift of this year for Tamako from his drawer full of gifts from the previous years, which he couldn't give to Tamako as he was scared. He went with other shop owners to Tamako's house, but saw that Tamako was calling for help. He ran and started slapping Tamako's back, thinking she was choking. Tamako's father took matter, well took Dara in his hands and shook him. Dara came back to his senses and shouted that Mochi is delicious. Tamako's birthday came to an end like this and everybody forgot to give their gifts to Tamako. Dara decided to stay a little longer there. At night, while they were sleeping, suddenly Dara's eyes lit up and showed a video of some people calling Dara's name. The everyday life of the Tamea household was going well with their newest member, Dara, who was quite accustomed to his new life along with Tamako. He slept alongside Tamako, got up with her, and freshened up as well. Tamako helped her father and grandfather with mochi making while Dara binged on mochis he took from Tamako, thinking it was her love token for him. She wanted to make some mochis especially for Valentine's Day. They all sat together to have breakfast and asked Dara how much longer he was going to stay here. He said that he would start his travel during spring, as it was tough to travel in winter but also due to the unspoken reason that he was so fat now that he couldn't fly at all. Grandpa asked why he felt that spring would be the ideal choice. Dara said that spring brings a new breeze and a loving stutter in girls' hearts. As he was searching for his country's prince's bride, he thought that spring would help him to find the perfect bride candidate for his prince. Tamako said that she would take him to the pet shop to help, and Dara agreed. She told her father to make heart-shaped mochis, so that more customers come and eat the mochi. But her father was strictly against selling such frivolous-looking mochi. Dara heard the word Valentine and had piqued an interest towards it. He saw a TV show about the upcoming Valentine's Day, and got to know that girls give their loved ones chocolates in hope of their love blooming. Meanwhile, Tamako still did not lose hope and designed different shapes of mochis, while everybody was discussing their upcoming Valentine's Day plans, Midori came and saw that Tamako was busy with her latest mochi discovery. Soon, Kano joined them and she looked exhausted and sleep-deprived. They asked her about it and she said that she was making a design to make a chocolate-shaped house. Midori told them that they were totally ignoring the main subject of Valentine's Day. They looked around and saw all the girls talking about Valentine's Day and chocolates. Kano said that she also found some guys talking about how they were expecting chocolates from Midori. Tamako also said that Midori is quite famous with guys and girls because she always gets chocolates from him. Midori asked if Tamako was going to give anyone chocolate this year. After school ended, Tamako found Dara waiting for her outside the market, and both of them went together to the florists. Tamako noticed that their market did not have anything that you off the Valentine's Day aura. She asked a vendor if he had any plans for Valentine's Day, but it turns out nobody had any plan to commemorate the day and advertise their market. Makizu was sleeping when he heard a noise and saw Tamako gesturing him something. He seemed to understand what she was trying to say and brought out the cup phone. He threw one cup towards her way, and they started talking. Tamako told him about the situation, how the market was feeling dead and not alive at all. She wanted to do something about it and ask him to come to the shop owner's meeting. Tamako and Makizu went to the Yusajiyama market meeting together. Tamako's father was surprised to see Tamako there, but before he could say anything, Mochizu's father entered with his Valentine Day-themed t-shirt and got into a fight with him. That's how the weekly Yu Sajiyama meeting started. The elder said that Tamako had an idea for the market. She started talking in a robotic, nervous tone, suggesting they should do something fun while keeping the theme of Valentine's Day in mind. Everybody seemed to like that idea and put their ideas forth too. 
Tomako's father said that Valentine's Day and Mochi are two different things and they wouldn't go together. He just left. While Mochizu said that he would also do his best to help by making an advertisement, since he was in the film studies group, everybody was very excited about the upcoming events that they would plan. Tamako's father said that even though Tamako was doing what she usually does all the time, this time everybody was going along with her plans. He saw that everybody had already put their plans into action, while making sure every nook and cranny of the market was decorated with Valentine-themed decorations. The whole market was brimming with the idea of love and falling in love. Tamako had called Midori and Kano to help with their advertisement. She even wore a rabbit costume along with Kano. Midori was called by her grandfather, who told her to come to the shop and put a display just like how she used to do in her childhood. She refused, getting shy, and her grandfather made a performance, saying that everybody falls in love with somebody. She suddenly got all quiet and went back to Tamako's shooting. Dara had made his appearance to look over the shooting. He was acting all sleazy after looking at Midori, and even thought that Kano fancied him when she sneezed on him due to her bird allergy. Midori said that she needed to go for a while, and went to the coffee shop with Dara. He said that she must be hurting on the inside because she can't get him, but she said it was not like that, and got silent again. By the time she came back, the advertisement shoot was done. They all gathered together to watch the ad, but somehow the projector wasn't working, so Dara put the USB in his mouth, and the video started playing by his eyes. They were all surprised for some time but got their attention back on the ad, which turned out to be great, pleasing everyone. After the ad had ended, another video played where a boy and girl of exotic features were seen. The boy started saying how he missed him and how hot it was in their country. He had bought all the fruits that Dara liked. The video stopped playing after that, and the next morning, Tamako saw that her father had made heart-shaped mochi just like she wanted him to make. She gave her father chocolates for Valentine's Day as usual, and asked Midori on their way if they would also give their loved one chocolates one day. Midori jokingly said that it wasn't possible in her case and went off laughing. The father Du were fighting as usual, while Dara whined about how he hadn't got even a single chocolate from his admirers. The new season of spring was here and Dara was supposed to start his journey again to search for a bride for his prince. However, the way he was gaining weight day by day after munching on mochis, it seemed rather impossible for him to do that yet. He could fly for a short bit of time but got tired easily after traveling a small distance. Tamako was busy making cherry blossom themed mochis for the new season, and even got assigned to a new class for the year. Kano and Tamako were in the same class and Machizu was sad because he wanted to be in the same class with Tamako, but his luck seems to have run out this year too. Dara was trying to fly, but after flying for some time, he was falling and got saved by a Saguri, a straight-faced girl from Tamako's class. Dara fell in love with her after meeting her. Asajiri was also in the same class with Tamako and introduced herself to everyone as Asajiri Shiori, the badminton club captain. Tamako wanted to have a conversation with Asajiri, but for some unknown reasons, she always avoided Tamako. After the class ended, Mochizu found Dara outside the school waiting ardently for his love Asajiri. He tried to follow her but lost his way. He tried to use his bird direction senses but majorly failed after falling again but luck was in his favor when Asajiri caught him again. He told her that he lives in the Usajiyama market shop and Asajiri took him with her to the market, where everybody acknowledged her as Tamako's friend. They even gave her food and flour. Tamako was a bit surprised to see Asajiri in her shop but welcomed her nonetheless and treated her with her handmade special cherry blossom mochi. She even met Anko and got acquainted with each other. Asajiri had a message from her mother saying that she'd be home late and Tamako told her to stay for dinner. She agreed and made food for everyone. They also went to the boathouse together and had a good time. Tamako said that she was welcome here anytime and Asajiri went back home. Dara tried to propose a walk together in the cherry blossom but Asajiri left before she could hear his pitiful confession. The next day, Tamako went to Asajiri's seat and told her hi. She wanted to say more to her, but Asajiri ignored her and left the room. Kano saw this and asked Tamako if there was anything wrong between them. Tamako told her that everything was fine and how they even had a nice time together. Asajiri was in the bathroom and practicing in front of the mirror as to how she could say thanks to Tamako for her hospitality yesterday. Midori came in which threw her off guard and she left. She tried to say thanks to Tamako during the practice time but couldn't due to Dara's constant pestering. Dara again followed Asajiri and fell in front of her in order to make it out their destiny. She picked him up as usual and he said that she was very kind, considerate, and an amazing person. She said that she was none of those things. He said that she should stay by the shop again today, but she said that she hadn't even said thanks to Tamako for the other day. She suddenly had a thought and said that he should pass the message to Tamako, saying that she was thankful for the other day. Dara said that it would be better if she said it to her herself. She suddenly heard their homeroom teacher calling her, 
asking for the location of Tamako's house for a teacher's visit. She showed him the way, and they both got greeted by the shop owners at the market. Asajiri sat outside while the teacher was talking to Tamako's father, and Tamako said that they should go to the coffee shop. They left Dara behind because he seems to be following Asajiri too much. Tamako gave her a gift and said thanks for the other day. She told that if she and Dara were imposing on her too much, then she should tell her. Asajiri said that it wasn't the case, and she had a lot of fun with them. She got a bit embarrassed after saying this, and Tamako assured her that she also had a lot of fun together, and they should hang out again. She said that they were friends now, and Asajiri happily agreed. They bid each other farewell. Dara was waiting for Asajiri outside, thinking if he was bothering her. Even though the fact was true, but Dara's big fatty stomach and ego hid the fact from him, and he believed that Asajiri also loved him. He fell in front of her again, stating that they were destined, but Asajiri didn't give a penny for his thoughts. She thanked him for helping her to become friends with Tamako. Dara said that he didn't do anything, but it was her own efforts that she could become friends with her. He offered her a single piece of his feather as a token of love, but Asajiri casually declined and left. Tamako told about her newly blossomed friendship with Asajiri to Migori, who told her about the bathroom incident. Tamako felt the sincerity of Asajiri's words and became happy. Dara was getting fatter and fatter each day, with Tamako indulging him on different types of mochi several times every day. He was now so chubby that he could not even stand straight. Anko asked how many mochis he had eaten in a day to be so gigantic that he looks like a chicken. He told her not to compare him with livestock as he had a noble soul. He said that he, as a grandiose creature, doesn't give thought to such trifling matter. He eats whatever he is served as a way of Tamako showing her service towards him. Anko told him not to give in to temptation that easily and stop listening to her sister's whims so much as she is not much of a thinker. They had a childish argument after that, but it stopped when Dara heard some drum noise outside and asked Anko what was this noise all about. Anko said that it was for the upcoming festival. He got happy hearing this because carnivals and festivals were the time when girls leave their worries behind and the flowers of love bloom on trees. He was sure that he would find a bride for his prince in this festival, but the problem arose when he couldn't even fly outside the window. Anko gave him some medicines and Tamako came at that moment wearing a jacket saying, You said Yama Market. She was very excited about the festival and wanted Anko to wear one too, who was not so excited about the idea. The next day, Tamako and Anko got ready to go to school. They saw Mochizu's father wearing the jacket and headband to commemorate the festival. The father Du again got into a fight because of their differences in business ethics and Anko decided to go first. She got many things from the shop owners and didn't know what to do with them. Tamako said that she could distribute the foods between her classmates, but Anko didn't like the idea. Midori and Kano came soon and greeted Anko. Anko told them to call her Anne and not Anko, as she finds her name too old-fashioned. Suddenly, she hid behind Tamako and told them to stay quiet. They saw that two boys from Anko's school were going past them and Anko didn't want to be seen by them. Midori understood that Anko seems to like one of the boys. After the boys left, Anko gave the foods to Kano and went off to school. At school, Anko seems to be in a deep thought, sitting in her seat, and her friends came to ask if she was going to come with them to the museum next Sunday. She also learned that the boys from before were also going. She said that she would go with them, but there was a problem with the plan because the festival was due on Sunday. She asked for her father's permission to go, but he told her to help at the shop the next Sunday. She got angry and went to her room sulking. Tamako went to her room to show how Dara looked in her handmade customized jacket only to find her sulking on her bed. She said that she was not interested in the festival. Machizu threw the cup phone into their room and Tamako told her to talk to him as she had to do some work for the shop. They talked and Machizu asked if Tamako was going to come to the portable shrine as he wanted her to see him carrying the shrine. Anko got an idea and asked him if he was free on Sunday. At dinner, she told that Mochizu would help them on Sunday on her behalf. Her father didn't want that as he thinks that Mochizu was after his secret mochi recipe, besides, he also had to help his father. Anko said that it wasn't the case as Mochizu only wanted to make mochi with Tamako, and his father can just deal with it, but her father still didn't agree. Anko's grandpa told her to wake up early and complete her part of the work so that she can go with her friends in the afternoon. She agreed to do that and woke up early on the festival day just as planned. Tamako's friends, as well as Asajiri, had come to help them. Meanwhile, the top show piece of the portable shrine was broken, and the people were vexed as to what to do now. They saw Dara flying and he sat on the top of the shrine out of his own volition. They decided to catch him and put golden paint over him, making him the showpiece. Even though he was flying away from them, he soon adapted to the idea of being a magnificent showpiece, due to his narcissistic traits. On the other hand, Anko had completed her work and went off. 
but Floris asked for her help to get the girls ready for the procession. She remembered how her mother used to get her ready like this and help the girl too. She remembered that she was getting late, but the girl asked if she was going to go away, and at the end, she couldn't go. She saw the whole procession and even enjoyed it. Taumako and the others saw her and asked if she didn't go to the museum. She said that she couldn't bear to leave and started selling special edition mochis. Suddenly, the boys from before came and she got flustered seeing them. She ran to her room and hid in the closet. Everybody tried to get her out of the closet, but every idea failed. The boy who wore glasses came into the room, saying that they had brought a souvenir for her and called her out. She came out after some time and accepted his gift with blushing cheeks. That is how the festival ended on a sweet note, with Dara taking a bath in a small bucket. The summer was at the doorstep and the heat had already been kissing the feet of the residents. Mokizu was seen sitting in the shop on an idle summer afternoon. He was scolded by his parents to work with more enthusiasm, but he was still bored. He saw Tamako and her friends go to the town pool. Tamako asked him to join them, but Midori told her not to invite him as he would see them in swimsuits, and Mochizu respectfully declined. They went to the pool and Midori started to teach Tamako how to swim, as she wasn't a good swimmer. Midori told her to practice more as they were going to go on a two-day school trip to the beach soon. Meanwhile, Mochizu was constantly spacing out for some reason, and his mother said that it must be because he was thinking about Tamako. He got flustered hearing this and went back to his room. He thought that he should have gone with her to the pool. He started fantasizing about going to the pool where Tamako lovingly invited him, but even in his fantasy as always, he said something totally opposite of what he had wanted to say and declined her by saying that he didn't come here to hang out with her. He got interrupted by Dara, who was listening to his ramblings. Dara had heard everything and understood that he was in love with someone. He tried to guess some names and finally hit the jackpot upon mentioning Tamako's name when Mochizu blushed profusely. He said that as a noble bird, he had quite the gallancy and maturity in such matters and could give him great advice. Mochizu wasn't very eager to get his advice, but Dara caught his attention when he said that Tamako had courted him before. Dara started saying how Tamako coveted him, a noble retainer, but he had to decline her due to his noble identity, but he was well adept in her tastes and likings. Dara was open to help Mochizu win her heart, and soon the day of the school trip was here. Tamako, as always, brought Mochi with her to enjoy with her friends, while Mochizu had brought Dara in his bag to his quest on making his unrequited love successful. Tamako and the girls went to their room and were discussing all the things they would do on the trip. Midori went out for a while and saw Dara talking to Mochizu. They were talking about Dara helping him with his courting while Dara would get to see the beach as a reward. Dara asked him if he had the letter ready, and he took out the letter he had written for Tamako and started reciting it. Midori disrupted them, asking what was Dara doing here with Mochizu. Dara was about to tell them the truth, but Mochizu stopped him. Midori had already gotten an idea about what they were trying to do and went back. Mochizu told Dara to take his letter to Tamako as he had promised, but before he could reach her, Midori shut off the room window purposefully. She saw Mochizu standing with Dara. Mochizu confronted her about it and she said that he should stop bothering Tamako and following her around. She knew what he was trying to do and told him to back off as Tamako did not have any interest in him at all. He said that he was just concerned about Tamako because she was a bit ditzy and they were childhood friends. Midori did not agree with him and said that she would protect her and they both got into a silly argument over who knew Tamako better. But the argument didn't last long as Dara came running to Mochizu, climbing on him to save himself from a vicious cat. Dara tried to tell them that they both had the same concern over Tamako, but Midori left without saying anything. The next day, Dara was watching the sun and remembering his prince, but got chased by a seagull. Meanwhile, Tamako and the girls went swimming, with Mochizu wishing her good luck. Midori asked her what she thought of Mochizu and she said that they were childhood friends and Mochi buddies. Midori asked what she thought of her and Tamako said that she loved him making Midori happy. Dara came to Tamako, but had to fly again due to the seagull. Tamako was tired after the swim, but it was time for fireworks and Kano tricked her into waking up. They went to the beach to see fireworks. Midori told Mochizu that he was open to tell whatever it was he wanted to tell Tamako. Mochizu said that it was fine and he did not want to say anything to her. Tamako called them over to watch the fireworks together, and the trio ended with all of them enjoying the fireworks together. Tamako was cleaning the god's temple on the road and praying to it. Dara was interested in it and asked what she was doing in front of the stone lump. Tamako said that it was not a stone slump but a Wiyasama. They pray in front of him and he protects the kids and people from bad things. Dara said that the stone doll was too heavy to throw at their enemies as a way of protecting themselves. Tamako told him not to say something like that as he would have to face divine retribution because of it. He asked what divine retribution was and she said that it was a punishment from the god for offending them and bad things would happen to him. Dara was quite intrigued to learn a new thing. 
The more he felt he knew everything about them, the more he learned that they were still full of wonders. He stayed behind to bask in the glory of his newfound information while Tamika went back to the market. She saw that the whole market was practically empty. She called for a neighborhood market meeting and said that she stood in the market throughout the noon and saw only 13 people going in. The elder said that it was quite usual because of the scorching heat. People avoided going outside, and it was the summer slump time. Tamako said that's where the pamphlets come in. She wanted more customers to come, and the best way to attract them was through pamphlets. She wanted to organize a haunted house for the customers. Everybody agreed to the idea, and Tamako called her friends to discuss more about the haunted house. Dara was also a part of their discussion. He was eagerly waiting to see if Asajiri was coming, but both her and Mokizu couldn't come due to their practice and field trip. They started talking about their haunted house plans, and Dara asked what a haunted house was. They told him that it was a house which was haunted and people come there to get scared as fear brings an adrenaline rush into people's heart. Dara was already getting scared hearing their plans. They went to the room which they were supposed to turn into a haunted house. Kano started measuring and said that they would need many cardboard boxes. The elder made an announcement for everyone to get boxes to help Tamako. The same night, Tamako's father was coming back from the boathouse, but when he went back to get his towel, he saw two strange fireballs dancing at a distance. He told everyone about the incident and one lady from the market said that she had even saw a salary man walking the streets drenched in blood all over. Everybody said that there was something wrong in the neighborhood. One person asked if the annual purification ceremony was held this year, but nobody had done it. They thought that they were cursed and decided to hide it from Tamako. They went with different items like garlic, alcohol, and salt to fend off evil, while making sure that Tamako did not know anything about the curse. The haunted house was completed, and they needed someone to go there and make sure that it was fine. Dara said that he wanted to go with Shiori as Kano had told him about a jinx. If two people go together to the haunted house, then their love would bloom. He went inside and got scared so much that he screamed throughout the whole time. Meanwhile, the market was filled with people attracted to the haunted house. The shop owners were thinking that something strange was happening in the market, but saw that the haunted house was getting all the rave from people. They decided to tell Tamako about the curse, and Shiori told them that everything was normal in the market. The haunted house was a major hit among customers, including Tamako's sensei, and the market was brimming with people as per Tamako's wish. They celebrate the success of the haunted house together, but Dara asked about the fireball and salaryman incident. Kano got up and said it was all her plan to attract customers. She had given a paint can to Dara and told him about the love jinx. As a result, Dara got excited and looked like a fireball, and he also dropped red paint on a harmless salaryman, making all these stories. Dara was throwing tantrums after learning that Kano had played him and got hurt. The projector in his eyes lit up, and the boy from before told Dara that Chuo was coming and asked him to take care of her. A girl was seen lurking in the neighborhood at night. Dara and Tamako's sleep got disrupted after hearing a whistling noise. Dara seemed in a hurry after hearing the whistle and went downstairs immediately. The girl from before was standing in front of him with a look of disdain towards him. There were many scary things on Earth, but this girl from the South Island was the most terrifying thing in the world for Dara. Choi, the demon lady herself, had come here for Dara. The only person who could get Dara down from his high horse was Choi, but he still had the pride of a man in him and tried to let his fear slide by acting confident, which did not work even for a second. Choi started scolding him for turning into a fatty lump instead of a bird. She nagged him for his weight and not responding to any of the messages they had sent to him. She said that the prince had been worrying about him endlessly all this time. Tamako and Anko saw this and thought that Dara was in big trouble. At the breakfast table, Choi introduced herself as a member of the royal family of the South Island. She thanked them for accommodating her after she came to their house unannounced. They asked if her name was Choi, and she said that her name was Choi Maka Disgusting. Much to Tamako's father's dismay, she told them that Dara was the royal pet and he had been out of their kingdom in search of the prince's bride. Tamako and Anko were excited hearing this and asked if she was a princess. She said that she and her family had been serving the royal family, Maka Disgusting, for generations. She's a fortune teller, and Dara helps her tell fortunes just like Augury. Dara heard his name being taken and couldn't control the surge of narcissism that suddenly came over him. He got up on the table to show his majestic ancestry, but got shoved by Choi, who was rather unamused by his actions. After having breakfast, Tamako left for school and told her friends about Choi, who was a fortune teller, and Dara, who was actually a royal pet. Meanwhile, Choi was trying to practice augury with Dara, but Dara had to fly in order for her to predict, but with his fatty stomach, it was all down the dumps before they could even begin. Choi bashed him for letting himself get so fat that he was practically useless. She was vexed if he hadn't got any messages from them as they hadn't heard a word from him or his whereabouts. She had to work a lot to search for him. 
She shook him unconscious and found their video messages. For some reasons, the messages only played out when he was unconscious. She asked him what he was doing living with his family when he was supposed to go and look for a bride for the prince. He lied to Troy out of fear of getting beaten to death. He said that Tamako had found him, and they all had fallen in love with him, stopping him from leaving. They also worked him like a horse in the mochi shop and fed him mochi forcibly. Choi thought that it was a trap and asked who trapped him. Dara lied that it was Tamako. Tamako was clueless about everything that was happening behind her back, only to come back home and find Choi sleeping. She wanted to help as a way of paying them back and tried to offer them money, which didn't work. Tamako said that they should have lunch together and have mochi, but Choi was being cautious and told her no. Tamako then took her to the market, where they met all the other shop owners who doted on her. She was getting many gifts from them. Tamako told them that she was a fortune teller, and they insisted her to predict something. She predicted that a white beast would get unleashed, and suddenly a big white dog came running into the market. They understood that Choi's predictions were accurate and became impressed by her. Tamako then took her to the bathhouse, where Choi fainted after getting too excited in the bath. She scolded Dara for making her face such humiliation, but accepted the dinner that Tamako left for her. The next day, Choi did fortune telling for everyone as a way of showing gratitude for the gifts. The shop owner guy from the vegetable store was in love with Sayuri, the granddaughter of the elder, but Sayuri announced that she was getting married and asked Choi if her marriage would be successful. Choi said that it would be a successful marriage, making everyone happy. They went to the bathhouse after this only to meet the guy who thanked Choi for telling such a beautiful future for Sayuri, even though he would not be in it. Choi remembered about her prince and fainted in the tub again, saying that she couldn't hear the waves and Tamako brought a CD for her to calm down. After she felt a bit better, she figured out that Dara was lying about the trap and had only let himself get fattened up. She tasted mochas made by Tamako and loved it. Tamako asked when she would go back and she said that whenever Dara's communication problem would get fixed. Tamako said that she did not want them to go soon. Koi said that they needed to find a bride for their prince. Tamako got curious and asked if there was any special way to learn if that's their prince's bride. Choi suddenly got a smell from Tamako and thought that it was a familiar scent. A new day started with all of them binging on mochi, while Choi had to constantly stop Dara from having too much mochi. Tamako had a phone call from Kano. She said that she wanted them to come with Dara to the coffee shop. Tamako said that she would come to the shop with Dara and went there along with Choi. They went and saw that Kano had made a house for Dara with leftover wood plates. Dara was again acting all high and mighty, but it all broke down when Choi said to Kano not to waste time making things for the likes of Dara. Kano told him to get inside the house, but the problem arose when Dara tried to enter. Turns out, even though Kano had taken perfect measurements and made a huge hole in the front for him to enter, Dara still got stuck. Kano pushed him inside, and after a lot of effort, he got inside only to get stuck in like a baked bread. They got him out with great difficulty, and Kano broke down after doubting her capabilities as a carpenter. She was unhappy with her skills as faulty measurements wasn't a good thing for a carpenter. She wanted to destroy it, but Choi stopped her. She told her that she was not at fault as she had made a perfect house. Rather, it was Dira's fault who had let himself go crazy on mochis, gaining more weight again. They all looked at him and felt that he had turned into a turkey chicken rather than looking like a bird. Midori suggested that it was time for Dara to go on a diet. It meant that Dara would have to stop his intake of mochis and excessive food. With Beethoven playing in the background, Dara felt that his doom was near. After that, they made Dara starve to help him lose weight. He was salivating over the mochis, and Mochizu's father went to give him one, but Kano came in time to stop him. She made him wear a makeshift banner that said nobody should give him any food while he is on a diet. The shop owners who usually spoil him fat with food saw this and told him to go back until he loses weight. During dinner, Dara was in his room starving and Tamako told everyone about his dieting. They went to Tamako's room, only to find Grandpa stealthily giving him food. He could not bear to see Dara in such a state, and Father also agreed with him. They decided that Dara's diet was at threat with her father and grandpa being here, so Tamako had to take him to school with her so that she could keep an eye on him. Choi said that she would also come to school, as it would put a burden on Tamako alone. Dara got scared hearing this and started making up excuses so that Choi doesn't attend school. He said that there were conditions like passing an exam and having a school dress for her to attend school. Choi said that she was smart enough to pass an exam and had developed a liking towards their clothing too. Dara thought that he had passed an obstacle, as there wasn't an extra school uniform for Choi, but Kano said that she had one extra uniform, marking Dara's doom again with ominous music playing in the background. The next day, Midori and Kano waited for Tamako to get Choi dressed while munching on mochi. Dara asked them to kindly share some with him, which they blatantly declined. Choi came back after wearing the uniform, and they went to school together with Dara, who would pose as Choi's stuffed toy. 
They attended classes together, and now came the time for Dara's exercise. They all threw batons at him while he had to fly and save himself as a part of his exercise. Finally, the day ended with Dara becoming a lifeless chicken. The fall was nearing and Choi was feeling a little chilly as she had grown up on the coastal side. Since it was her first time experiencing fall, they decided to take her shopping. She tried on different types of clothes but didn't buy anything and got back home. Dara was exercising at night when a message from their prince came in, asking if Choi and he were doing fine. Dara had turned into a skinny-bodied, bulbous-headed bird, which concerned everyone at the market. They gave him stuff wishing for his recovery, and Dara thought it to be offerings for him. Midori and Kano came and gifted Choi a sweater that suited her very much. The essence of fall was filling the air with friendship and love. This episode starts with a little snippet from the past. It was about the time when Tameko's mother had come to their mochi shop for some mamadu sweets, but as it was similar to Tamako's father's name, who was also her classmate, he misunderstood her and confessed his love for her. That's how the flower of love bloomed between them, turning an embarrassing memory into a lovely one. Tamako was making mochi and thinking about doing something new for the upcoming mochi day. She was humming the song which her mother used to hear. Dara had also remembered the music and asked if she had found the song yet. She said no and her father told her to stop with a red face. He went out and sang two lines of the song with a sad smile on his face. Anko came to Tamako and said that her friend would come to take some mochi from them. Tamako asked the name of her friend and she ran away after quickly shouting the name Yuzuki. At the breakfast table, Tameko proposed that they should pound mochi on display for the upcoming mochi day. Her father agreed after hearing that Mochizu's father was also putting on a show. Tameko was very excited for the day and told her friends about it. Kano was very eager to help as she found the act of mochi pounding similar to nail hitting. Mochizu was on his way home with his friends, talking about the mochi day plans which was also the day of his birthday. He saw Enko walking alone and ran after her. He asked if Tamako had asked for any advice about his birthday gift. Anko said that Tamako had totally forgot about his birthday, under the excitement for the mochi day. Anko seemed worried about something and ran away. Dara was shopping for dinner when she saw Anko going back home with a bad mood. Tamako came back home soon after Anko and their grandpa said that Anko seemed to be in a bad mood. She went inside and gave flower offerings to her mother as usual. Anko was in her room and she tried to lift her mood up, which seems down to her as well. At that moment, their father called them, telling that Anko's friend Yuzuki was here. Tamaka welcomed him at home while sending Dara to bring Anko. He called for her, telling that her boyfriend was here if Anko didn't come down. At night, Tamako called Mochizu and asked him to look after Anko. She asked him to find out what was bothering her, and he agreed. Next morning, he asked Anko if she had failed or was scolded by her teacher. Anko said that that was not the case. She finally succumbed to the pressure and said that Yuzuki was transferring, and he was going to move on the mochi day. The mochi day came, and everybody was happily enjoying the show. Anko also helped around with chores. Mochizu noticed that Anko was nowhere to be seen and went to look for her. He found her sitting in a corner of the shop and told her to go say goodbye to her friend. She didn't know what to say to him, and Mochizu told her to say, I love you, but Anko was too shy to say that to him. At that moment, Tamako came and handed her a bag of freshly pounded mochi. She told her to go and give them to Yuzuki because it tasted good while eaten fresh. Anko went running to meet Yuzuki and gifted him the mochi. He said that his family always bought mochis from their family shop during New Year, so he'll come and meet her in the New Year's. Meanwhile, Tamako's father was singing the song in his room, but Tamako happened to hear it and brought him to the cafe for the record guy to find it out. It turns out, this song was written by her father for her mother during their high school days. Her father was in a band with him, and they sang this song for her mother, Hanako. They saw the video of him singing this song in his younger days and Mamanu went back home to see the pictures of his wife, remembering the old times of their young love. Tamako went back home and told her father that she loves him even more now. At night, Tamako wished Mochizu happy birthday with a cake because everybody loves somebody. The school's cultural festival was nearing and Tamako's group had to give a bat and performance just as every year. Midori, as the team captain, won the lottery for their slotted time. Now came the time to decide the details of their performance. Kano had an idea that they should go with a New Year's fireworks performance. Tamako was excited to make the theme into a mochi festival. As the captain, Midori was handed the work of making the choreography and choosing songs for their performance. Tamako, Kano, and the others decided to work on the costumes. At home, Tamako told everyone about their cultural festival and showed the pictures of their previous festival. At night, Machizu and Tamako had a talk over their school festival. Makizu was from the film club, so he had to film a movie for their club participation. Tamako was worried about him overworking himself as he had a high fever. 
Machizu said that he was getting better now. Tamako told him about their performance and asked him to shoot it, as always. She also told him that Midori had taken upon the duty of choreographing their performance as the group captain. Mochizu was doubting if she could do the job, but Tameko insisted, saying that she was the captain. Turns out, Mochizu's doubt was right and Midori was having trouble coming up with something for their performance. Instead, she designed a costume for all of them, which got approved by everyone at school. They thought that Midori had completed her work for the choreography as well as the costume design, but Midori was too nervous to admit the truth. At home, Choi, who was an expert at needlework, was helping Tamako with sewing the costumes for their performance group. Tamako praised her for her quick hands and expert quality sewing, but Choi said that she had to work harder to better her work as she wanted to make the most beautiful wedding dress for her prince's bride. Tamako assured her that she would succeed. Cho wanted to ask something, but they got interrupted by a phone call from Midori, who wanted to ask about the costume productions. Midori felt even more guilty after hearing that everybody was working hard when she didn't even have a choreography ready. The next day, she went to the market to her grandfather's shop and roamed the market while chanting for an idea to come to her. Tamako came to learn from Midori's grandfather that she seemed to be in a worry of some sort and had come to the market. The next day, Kano and Tamako saw Midori spacing out in class. They did not know what was wrong with her and she didn't even answer her phone. Asajiri came to Tamako's home and told her that she had seen Midori worrying over their performance in the bathroom that day. Midori didn't come to school the next day and Tamako got to know from Makizu that she had a fever. They all went to Midori's house to see if she was doing fine. She said that she was feeling better now. Asajiri told her that she had heard her that day at the bathroom and Kano brought up all the ideas that she had thrown away in the trash. Midori apologized and said that she hadn't been able to come up with anything no matter how hard she tried and started crying. Tamako and the others tried to console her. Dara told her that it wasn't a big deal as dancing comes from within. He performed for them, cheering everybody up. They told Midori that they'll come up with something together and the next few days, they all worked hard for their performance. Finally, the cultural festival was here and the Batten group was excited to perform. Koi saw a mole on Tamako's neck, saying in her kind that it was the dark sign. After a successful performance, Choi came and bowed before Tamako, saying that she is the prince's bride. It all started when Choi received a prediction that the bride of the prince would be found in the northeast. She told Dara to go and find her because the prince was going to sit on the throne soon, and, as per the rituals, he was supposed to be with his princess before ascending the throne. The prince seems like a kind and nice guy who cared about Dara's safety. He told him to go safely and wish good luck upon him. In the present, the word about Tamako being a supposed princess got around the whole neighborhood. People of the market were happy for her, as they always thought that Tamako was someone special. Cho was also giving Tamako special treatment and asked Dara to acknowledge her with respect. Dara, on the other hand, complied with Choi due to the fear of getting castrated by her, but deep inside, he believed that there might be some sort of misunderstanding with the whole princess ordeal. Choi told him that Tamako smelled like the favorite flower of the prince and also had a special mark on the neck, which has been evident in all the princesses before her. She also had a deep connection with Mochis, making her the perfect candidate. Tamako still didn't believe her and was excited about getting the market medal after she collects all hundred shopping carts. Mochizu was also shocked after hearing this. Soon the word gets around her friends at school and they're also in disbelief about this sudden revelation. Tamako didn't make any comments on this except saying that it all might be just baseless. Midori told her to stay cautious. Meanwhile, Dara told Choi that she might be wrong. As she hadn't made any predictions on Tamako, but Choi didn't say anything other and that his manual instructions were here and he could get fixed. Tamako went to the market with her friends and finally collected all the stamps necessary for her medal. She went to the elder and collected her medal, which she happily showed off to everyone. Choi came and took Tamako with her and have a direct conversation with the prince. The prince thanked her for taking care of both Choi and Dara. They could not talk more after that because of communication issues. Choi told her that their prince was very kind and capable, even though he is young. They went back home and Tamako's father looked troubled for some reason. He went to the market meeting which was specially held for Tamako. They all wanted Tamako to be happy. Much as who said that it should be her decision if she wanted to marry the prince or not. Tamako's father looked solemn after hearing everything they said and just left, saying that Tamako is his daughter. He went back home drunk on some Irish coffee and said to Tamako that she should choose whatever makes her happy. At night, Machizu also told her that he'll be happy for her as long as she is happy wherever. Tamako felt frustrated about all this and fell asleep with Anko holding her. The next morning, Tamako couldn't find her medal and came outside to search for it. Suddenly, the prince came and showed her the medal, asking if she was searching for this medal, shocking everyone. Tamako was relieved to find her medal but was shocked to learn that he was indeed the prince. He was unable to recognize Dara, 
who welcomed him with open arms, well, in his case, wings, it was due to the fact that he was totally unrecognizable because of his enormous weight gain. They took him home where he introduced himself as Mecha Moki Disgusting. According to the customs of their island, everybody working for the royal family has to adopt the same name as the royals. He thanked Hamakoto for taking care of Choi and Dara and keeping them in her home. Tamako said that it was no big deal, and the prince ate at their house. Everybody came to know about the prince's arrival and wanted to talk to him. They took Mecha with them to the bathhouse to talk to him. Dara told Tamako's father that he should also ask him questions, but he said that Tamako should be the one to ask any questions regarding her own life. Meanwhile, at school, Tamako's friends were also shocked to know that the prince was at their house and came to take his bride. They told Tamako to choose carefully about what she wanted to do. Everybody surrounded Mecca and started giving him food and flowers and many presents. They asked him many questions too. Tamako and her friends came back to market only to find all the shops closed. She got scared for a while, thinking something ominous must have happened, just like the time of her mother's death, but she found that everybody was with Mecca at the bathhouse and her family was fine. Dara asked Tamako how did she feel about this whole becoming a princess situation. Tamako started telling how she grew up in this market, being a part of this whole neighborhood who were her family. They are the ones who helped her grow up with all the love and support. Everybody has showered her with love and gifts every day. They all loved her and her sister, just like their own daughters and granddaughters. They taught her everything that she knows now. She grew up with Mochizu as her best friend and his parents, who were just like her own parents. She loved everything about this neighborhood and her family. She was grateful to be born here. Dara ran to the bathhouse, hearing all this, and bowed to the prince, saying that Tamako was an uselessly kind-hearted girl who thinks of nothing but her family and Mochi. She is not fit to be the princess and begs the prince not to take her. Tamako came at that time and told that even though she was grateful, she can't leave this place and people. Toy said that it was her mistake because she hadn't read Tamako's fortune not even once as she wanted someone like Tamako to be the princess. Mecca said that he would not take Tamako as she wasn't a princess candidate. It was due to the flowers that the florist gives to Tamako that made her smell like him. It was actually a misunderstanding, which relieved everyone and most importantly Mokizu. Mecca asked Choi and Dara to come home with him and everybody bid them farewell with a happy yet heavy heart. But in the end, Dara didn't leave as he wanted to help them during the new year and a beautiful year passed with a bustling market and festivities. Dara went to the flower shop before he left and somehow fell asleep between the flowers. Tamako searched for him but couldn't find him, thinking that he left already. Mokizu was determined this year to give Tamako a gift and brought her a box of her favorite flowers with a sleeping Dara inside of it. She became very happy to find Dara and Mokizu's gift. The anime ended on a sweet note with Choi shouting at Dara to come back home and Dara being rotten spoiled by the Tamea family.